Well, good evening, everyone. And on behalf of the entire university community, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to what I know will be an outstanding program. I'd like to begin by acknowledging Dean Greg Jones of the Divinity School uh, and Jeremy Begme, the director of DITA and the mastermind of this great event. Jeremy, congratulations on 10 years of DITA. Uh, you may not believe this, but the traditional 10th anniversary gift is aluminum. <laughs> and, and while that may disappoint a spouse now and again, uh, it's meant to represent durability and flexibility of perspectives. Certainly that is fitting in this case. I also would like to acknowledge the McDonald uh, Agape uh, Foundation for generously underwriting this symposium. I understand that uh, we have with us, I've just had the pleasure of meeting Al McDonald, Chair, and uh, Vice Chairman and President Peter McDonald, who are here with us this evening. Thank you so very much for your support and welcome. So Goodson Chapel is not only a beautiful space, it's also a wonderful setting for this evening's event as it demonstrates the vital connection between uh, the spiritual and the aesthetic. On the wall over here to my right, you see this tapestry woven by a Duke Divinity graduate. The piece offers an interweaving of dark and light, of color and shadow, meant to represent the divine's ability to shine through even in our darkest moments. And up the balcony is the Richards and Folks pipe organ, which lifts the hymns sung by the congregants at the weekly work worship services here uh, in this space. And walking by the building on a spring morning, you can hear this beautiful music echoing out across the quad. And above me here, perhaps uh, the most vivid piece, the chancel cross, a universal image, but cast in a truly innovative way. The artist, Thomas Sayer, developed a process called earth casting, cutting shapes out of raw earth and then setting those in concrete and produced a piece that is simultaneously visceral and transcendent. These three pieces, I think, demonstrate the many ways that art can help us to access the spiritual, to better understand our relationship with the world around us, and to better understand our faith. It's through great art and music and through the interpersonal connections that they offer that we can seek answers to some of the most challenging questions that we face as human beings. And with that in mind, I want to congratulate all of you and thank all of you for the important work that you are doing. In this room this evening are the leading thinkers on theology and the arts from around the world. And I know, I have great confidence that this will be a very, very productive symposium. I'm delighted to welcome all of you to Duke University and to wish you the very, very best for this wonderful event. Thank you. Thank you, President Price. As some of you may know, I'm actually on my second tour of duty as Dean of Duke Divinity School, and DITA actually began during my first term as Dean. We had a new chair in uh, the Divinity School that was named in memory of Tom Langford, who had served as Dean of the Divinity School, Chair of the Religious Studies Department, and also Provost of Duke University. And Tom Langford exemplified the best of the intersections of divinity and a university. And so when we began to think about who might be a scholar who could occupy that chair, we began to think of somebody who had strength as a Christian scholar, and perhaps especially a Christian theologian, and also could represent engagement in the broader university. And Jeremy Begbie's name came to mind. We were able to invite Jeremy to come for an interview, 
And during that interview, he wove together his strengths as a classical pianist, as well as a well-trained Christian theologian in an extraordinary way, and you could sense the magic that was in the room. My oldest son, who at the time was a Duke undergraduate, uh, now a doctoral student under Jeremy, was in the room, and as soon as the, the talk had ended, my son came over to me and he said, either you hire him or I disinherit you. <laughs> it was a pretty clear message, and so uh, I persuaded the faculty that we needed to recruit Jeremy to come. And in those conversations, Jeremy said, I, don't know, I, I want not only to come to Duke, I'd really love to explore the development of an initiative that can weave together theology through the arts in powerful ways. And so we began to dream what might be possible. What I didn't realize was how much fruit would already be born as we came to the 10-year celebration this weekend. Through Jeremy's leadership and the constellation of work that many of you have done in collaboration, we've been able to highlight the significance of theology through the arts, through extraordinary projects and programs, doctoral students, people now spreading that word, and the conversations near and far. Because of the work that has happened here and the, the networks that have developed as a result of it, significantly through the support of the McDonald Agape Foundation, work on theology and music and modernity, theology and the visual arts, a steering committee that's worked on projects, a commissioning of a St. Luke Passion with the Scottish composer James McMillan. Dita has accomplished extraordinary work over the last 10 years, and none of it could have happened without the extraordinary scholarship, leadership, and catalytic vision of Jeremy Begbie, whom I'm delighted to welcome to the stage now to begin our evening program. Would you join me in welcoming Jeremy Begbie? Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Greg, and indeed for all your support over the years. President Price, donors, invited guests, registrants, all who are here this evening, I too welcome you to what I know will be an extraordinary feast of riches. Whether you're an artist or performer, donor or dilettante, emerging scholar or fast declining scholar, we are, we are delighted by your presence with us. Our sense of gratitude is immense to performers, painters, poets, donors and supporters. Sadly, they are too numerous to mention individually. And let me say straight away in this talk, if you are not mentioned, please do not be offended. I have time only for a few representative names. I do have a want to single out straight away, of course, the McDonald Agape Foundation, who have underwritten this symposium. Your support has meant so much over so many years, more than I could ever say. For 10 years now, here at Duke, we've aimed to generate a vibrant conversation between theology and the arts that serves the aims of this school within this university. I've been asked to say a word or two about what we're about. Basically, research, teaching, and art in action. Research has taken the lead. We believe the possibilities for fresh scholarly work that serves church, academy, and society at large are boundless. Publications, projects, colloquia, it can take many forms. Our doctoral and postdoctoral students are key to this, and I'm delighted that over the next three days they'll be meeting with other emerging scholars to forge new paths for the years to come. They'll be convened by our former student, David Taylor, whose latest book is provided free to delegates, and whose recent claim to fame is a conversation he engineered between Eugene Peterson and Bono, now available online. On a wider front, our leading current research project with Yale and Cambridge aims to show how the arts can help us read the theological currents of modernity. The first book from that on music will be out next year with Oxford University Press. Associated with that is the recent publication of Mihol O'Shiel's epic poetic reflection on modernity, The Five Quintets. Stanley Harwas writes, this is a beautiful book, a beautiful book of hope because of O'Shiel's unrelenting passion to tell us the truth. Another reviewer, the most important work of English language literature to be published so far this century. And I suppose with a review like that, <laughs> what you can do is retire gracefully. I, mean, I think I'd be happy with that one. 
Now, you can hear Miho and Richard Hayes in conversation tomorrow morning. Research goes hand in hand with teaching. A certificate in theology and the arts for our master's student has been set up thanks to the energies of my wonderful colleague, Dan Train, who now has some 50 students. Flexibility is the name of the game in theological education these days, which means short units or courses that can be taken as part of a varied program, sometimes online. And that many, many disciplines need to be involved wherever possible. We've been blessed by a range of visiting teachers and speakers over the years, including Sandra Bowden here. This is Sandra here this evening? No, not yet. She's on her way, I think. And recently, Saskia Keeley, a journalist who spoke about photography workshop, workshops she set up in the West Bank for Muslims and Jews. And then in the midst of all this art in action, we've been delighted to partner with St. George's Nashville to help develop a vibrant arts ministry in a local church setting. A team from St. George's is here. Likewise with Reality Ministries here in Durham, a community of diverse abilities and disabilities. As Greg mentioned, we were proud to commission a St. Luke Passion by Sir James McMillan, which arose out of conversations between the composer and a multidisciplinary group of biblical and theological scholars. It was premiered here in Duke Chapel with Durham's Children's Choir. A dance collaboration with the Office of Black Church Studies. A commissioned painting from Bruce Herman, who is here tonight. We welcome Bruce and his colleague Jack Redford back here for this symposium. A concert last March marking the publication of this book by faculty member Shi Lian about a Christ, uh, Christian Chinese martyr, Lin Xiao. The conductor at the concert here is Carlos Colon, who, together with the ever-productive Malcolm Geit, will be leading our worship at Dita 10. And an event two years ago in this chapel bringing together an orchestra of professional musicians of faith. You can hear them on Saturday night. This is the Dean of Duke Chapel, Luke Parry. Now, to be honest, there's something in me that cringes at success talk. I am, after all, a Brit, and the Brits are much happier agonizing over problems than celebrating <laughs> solutions. Just look at Brexit. <laughs> uh, so let's be clear, we're guilty of making many blunders, many missed opportunities, most of them of my own making. But after 10 years, we're convinced that the interplay between the arts and articulate Christian wisdom is more important than ever, and especially in our current cultural climate. The other day, I came across this from environmentalist John Robinson of the University of British Columbia. Our failure to address environmental issues is not a failure of information, but a failure of imagination. We need to reimagine the way we are relating to the physical world around us. We tend to think there's only one way to do that. And it's the arts, of course, that specialize in jolts of the imagination. The arts at their best jerk us out of thinking that the way things are now is the way things have to be. The arts are not simply exotic extras. There will always be art as long as we are creatures of hope. And that could hardly be more relevant for a faith which by its very nature is animated by hope. Now, of course, we're aware that many of you have been plowing the theology and arts field for a long time. Some of you may have known Bono for even longer than David Taylor. But that's why we're here, to sense together where God might be tugging us in the next 10 years and beyond. The vision we seek is wider than any one of us can dream up on our own. So conversations are going to matter more than anything else. And out of these conversations, a book will appear, certainly, pulling together the fruits of the symposium. But much, much more, we hope. Partnerships, projects, journals, online resources, who knows? And speaking of wide visions, it doesn't get much wider than creation and new creation. So let me say a word or two about this double-headed theme and why we've chosen it. First, and most obviously, because it resonates with the arts. Artists create, fashion clay, construct theater sets, shape stories. We speak about artistic creativity, the creative process. And the new in new creation, that too has obvious links with the arts. Artists bring about things that haven't existed before. 
Indeed, artists often have a kind of fetish for the novel, the original, the unexplored, the unprecedented. The theme also resonates with the arts in that it deals with the things of this earth, matter embedded in space and time. Creation and new creation are about God forming this very material world out of nothing, and for some strange reason, refusing to let it go when things go wrong, working to recreate it. All very relevant to those who spend hours scraping wood, mixing paint, rubbing brass, picking at strings. But the other main reason we've chosen this theme is because it's so obviously biblical. In fact, you could say it sums up the Bible's basic plot line from creation to new creation, from the explosive let there be of Genesis to the dazzling new heaven and earth of Revelation. God makes, God remakes. It's a plot line that bursts to the surface, most of all in the Apostle Paul, in passages like 2 Corinthians 5. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Galatians 6 also, not to mention Romans 8. And let's not forget those texts are only echoing earlier Jewish scripture, like Isaiah, who wrote quite openly of a new heaven and a new earth. To be frank, looking back over the last 10 years in the theology and arts scene, I'm surprised how little sustained attention there has been to scriptural text. After all, it's in these writings, above all, that we're put in touch with God's most decisive action in this world, climaxing in Jesus Christ. The identity of Christian faith is always going to depend on these texts more than any others. However much we might learn from von Balthasar or Waltersdorf, Aquinas or Barth, Coakley or Tanner, however mesmerized we are by Maritain or Marion or Kristeva, indeed any philosopher, French or otherwise, <laughs> unless, <laughs> unless at the same time we keep returning to what these texts bear witness to and mediate, I doubt we'll get much beyond running around in our own self-made circles. So for the rest of my time, let me try to unfold this double theme a little, creation and new creation, give some pointers about how I hope it'll be especially fruitful for this symposium. And I want to concentrate on new creation in particular, since it's through the new creation that the nature, the deepest nature of the first creation comes fully to light. Some lines from a poem by Richard Wilbur, given to me by the late and great Roger Lundeen of Wheaton College, whose dear wife is with us this evening. Wilbur muses on the fact that we never really invent anything, but as he puts it, merely bear witness to what each morning brings again to light. A lot of what we see amazes us, wind and breath, dew on oak leaves, shade on soil, but most amazing is that all these things are there before us, before we look or fail to look, there to be seen or not by us. There before us. I want to suggest this goes, this applies not just to creation, the created world, obviously, but even more to new creation. New creation is there before us in three senses. First, it's there before us in that it's behind us. It is something already achieved. It's one of the marks, of course, of modernity that humans have come to think that the only significant things to happen in history are things we've made happen. That's why great when Christians insist that the most decisive event within world history didn't happen because we made it happen. But that's what lies behind Paul's talk of new creation something already achieved before we lifted a finger. Just as ancient Israel repeatedly spoke of a rescue from slavery already realized, the Exodus, so new creation speaks of a new rescue, a new liberation already achieved. This is the alreadiness of new creation, that God the Creator has in some extraordinary way entered what Paul has called the old age already submitted to the worst on our behalf, already snapped the chains that hold us down, already recreated a physical human body in our midst. It's there before us, 
nailed into the world's history, su Pontio Pilato, et resurrexit. Jesus of Nazareth, decisively particular and particularly decisive. I remember once at the seminary where I used to teach, we had a visit from the then Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, that Welsh sage whose eyebrows alone bear their own kind of witness <laughs> to the abundance of the new creation. We, and they're still growing. I can assure you, I saw them the other day. They're still moving. They're uh, still on the go. Okay. Just extraordinary. We asked him what he'd like us to teach our students. He just said one thing. It's very simple. He said, I'd like them to sense the pressure out of which Christianity burst. He was saying that for the New Testament writers, they didn't set out to write something tidy called the New Testament. Something had happened to them, world-shaking had happened in their midst, with its epicenter in a body risen from the dead. Something had erupted in their midst, someone who embodied a victory that could never be undone. A door had been opened irreversibly, undoably. This is the primal pressure of Christianity. From an American sage, another sage, American sage, James K.A. Smith, who's fast catching up with Rowan on the flourishing follicles front. You will notice. <laughs> he asks, how many paradigms of supposedly Christian political the op theology operate as though the resurrection never happened? How many paradigms of supposedly Christian accounts of the arts operate as if the resurrection of the crucified one never happened? Of course it's hard to believe. My goodness, it's hard to believe. But suppose it were true. Um, in the same circle of ideas, uh, my wife's birthday had just passed, and I wanted to give her a set of photographs arranged in a book. You know, you can send them away, send your photos away to these sites online. And when it was ready, they sent me an email back, this one. Don't you love that? <laughs> your creation has been made. It's actually got a lot to it, that. And you see what I'm trying to say. In Christ, the new creation has been. So there we are. Just remember that. Theological statement from Photobox. If there's a representative there tonight, you know, I'd love to see you afterwards. We can, we can have a talk about Jesus. Okay. <laughs> second, just because of this, second, new creation is there before us. In the second sense, it's ahead of us. This too lies behind Paul's talk of new creation. The raising of the crucified Jesus is a preview of what will happen to Tapanta, all things, and no less. Let's be clear, when 2 Corinthians 5 speaks of new creation, the vista is cosmos-wise. Just read our own Richard Hayes, along with a brilliant monograph by Ryan Jackson. The backstory is Jewish, a belief that God is committed to this world and committed to giving it a future beyond imagining. God dwelling with his people, the bereaved dancing, the voiceless singing, those denied justice in this life, joining the cry of the righteous, holy, holy. All this in the midst of a giant cosmic makeover. The Balinese artist, Naoman Darsani, paints the lush landscape of his homeland. But not even Bali looks this good. This evokes the new heaven and the new earth, a perpetual stream flowing from God's throne, nourishing the tree of life. Here, a giant mango tree. The rich life of the new creation, nourishing, endlessly profuse. And so to a third sense of there before us. New creation is there before us in that it's accessible to us now. It's there. This is by a former student, Bethany Tobin, who was the, one of the, in the first theology and arts class I taught here. She was in this class, and, and uh, she's not here tonight, but some in that class are. The painting she very kindly painted for me, and that's in my office. It's called Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit. Notes of music, some of you will see particularly in the front, a manuscript paper here, music notes. Notes of music push into the present, the music of the future bursting in to the here and now. This is the work of the Holy Spirit, the life of the new creation 
becoming accessible now. Or words from John Donne, 17th century, written when the poet believed he was on his deathbed. Since I'm coming to that holy room, where with thy choir of saints forevermore, I shall be made thy music. As I come, I tune the instrument here at the door, and what I must do then, think here before. Like a child who hears a great choir and orchestra through a crack in a concert hall door, the music she longs one day to join, she starts to tune in and join in now. Two other images. I love that one. Isn't that wonderful? And let's never forget talk of new creation in 2 Corinthians 5 leads straight into a talk of the ministry of reconciliation. Any reconciliation we know today is a foretaste of the reconciled community of the great tomorrow. Peter Kuzmik, missiologist, hope is the ability to hear the music of the future and faith is the courage to dance to it now. Now, it's interesting because dance is a metaphor there, obviously. But what if we were to rethink the art of dance along these lines as capable of affording now a concrete preview of the redeemed body of 1 Corinthians 15, released from the gravity of sin and death? This is Leah Glenn, who will be dancing for us later. She arrives tomorrow. She'll be dancing on Saturday night with others, with Uwe Steinmetz, who I saw over there. Is that right, Uwe? Our saxophone friends. Well, with that in mind, it seems fitting at this point to hear an invocation of the Spirit, and especially appropriate at the start of a conference like this. So here to sing the ancient chant, Veni Creato, the distinguished soprano, dear friend, and doctoral theology student at, unfortunately, another university, <laughs> Awet and Michael. Do come up. Awet. You're welcome.
hear from Awet again a little later. But what's new about it, this new creation? And how might this newness play out in the arts? the beginning of a piece called Capriccio. Bach, I think, is the ultimate musician of the new creation. And digging into this little piece, we begin to see why. Most of what Scripture says about new creation has a double-sidedness to it. And much depends on holding both sides together. And we can hear both sides here. First, new creation is new in the sense it doesn't simply flow out of the old. If you've ever tried to learn any Bach, you'll probably be more irritated than anything else, at least to begin with. And that's just because when you think you got it and you know what's going to come next, you'll throw in a musical banana skin, something you couldn't guess in advance. For instance, so I'll do it again. That's what ought to happen if the sequence just carries on. This is what actually happens. Oh. Where did all that come from? <laughs> Even once you know the style well, it's very hard to predict. And scholars have been fascinated by this and analyzed it at length. It's as if he's constantly trying to undermine any sense of inevitability of living in a closed world of predictability. There's no have to about this music. In fact, the piece, as I said, is called Capriccio. It's almost capricious, yet it makes wonderful sense. Bach lived at a time when closed worldviews were on the rise, and they come in two main forms. There's the mechanistic form, where the world is seen as a Newtonian system of cause and effect. So if you know the precise location and momentum of an atom, its past and future can be precisely calculated. Or to bring that all down to earth, go to a restaurant in town, and sometimes you'll see a couple like this. And don't worry, this photo was set up deliberately. I wasn't snooping. This either actors playing a part. A couple. Nothing new expected. Just same old, same old. A relationship that's turned adagio molto. Sempre... <laughs> Sempre diminuendo, just winding down into old age, the old age of sin and death, as Paul had it. Ian Milgochrist's wonderful phrase, the cheerless gloom of necessity. Now remember, Bach lived surrounded by death. He lost half his 20 children to infant mortality. Yet his music constantly pushes against it. And then the second model of necessity, the organic. I'm oversimplifying, but you'll get the point, I'm sure. Here the metaphor is one of growth. The future grows smoothly out of the old, like the tree from an acorn. But of course, this can be just as deterministic. The Bach scholar Lawrence Dreyfus argues there's virtually nothing organic in Bach in the sense of the inexorable development of an inbuilt formula. There's too much invention for that, too much intervention. Things out of the blue, changes of direction, things turned upside down. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Isaiah is not talking about something programmed from the start and not something just lurking inside the world or indeed inside us, just waiting to be activated. 
This is a fresh action of the Creator God, something breathtakingly new in the midst of the old that will never grow old. They run and will not grow weary. And that arcs ahead to Easter Day when the same God raises Jesus from the dead, the radical new start in the midst of the old, the new start that won't grow old. How on earth do you paint that or picture that? Very hard. Now, of course, we can still play Bach as if we were caught up in the cheerless gloom of necessity. Just go to a teenage piano competition <laughs> where you hear this sort of thing. Behold, I'm doing an old thing, and it's boring. <laughs> Isn't it interesting that musicians call this kind of playing unforgiving? See, without, without something authentically new, there can be no forgiveness. We will be trapped in endless cycles of recrimination and revenge. Bach knew there was another possibility, another kind of justice, and it's called new creation. And he played it out in sound, or at least when you play it, like I think he meant it. So I'm just giving these little kind of hints of the twists and turns that he's taking you on. New creation. But there's another side to this, of course. And that is, new creation doesn't simply flow out. Sorry, that's, that's right. New creation doesn't simply flow out of the old. Certainly, we've seen that. But there's another side to it. And it's seen in this piece beautifully, actually. The piece starts... <laughs> Lovely. Second half begins like this. <laughs> he just turned it upside down. And he has a new theme. New creation is new in that it renews the old. It doesn't simply flow out of the old, but it renews the old. And if we happen to be Protestant, maybe we need to hear this. Because Protestants have something of an obsession with the radically new start, the new beginning. God breaking into the closed worlds we've made for ourselves. This is what fired the early theology of Karl Barth, and it lies behind a lot of modern evangelicalism, being born again. And thank God for that. But if that's all we hear, there might be problems. As when worship planners feel compelled to make this week's service as different as possible from last week's, the ultimate horror of being caught saying a prayer this week, we said last week. Or when pastors in every sermon thrust you into the valley of decision, goad you into making a completely fresh start, renouncing everything in your past and starting again. Forget the past, forget the future. Now is the time. Tonight is the night, the eschatological moment. I want you to get up out of your seats. Well, not now. You don't know. Which is all well and good until you start wishing you were able to sit down for more than two minutes. And the same thing crops up in the arts. Just think of all those isms in the 20th century. Cubism, surrealism, vorticism, all those isms. Many of them with a passion to wipe the state clean, start afresh, clear aware the layers of convention. God forbid that anyone should ever call us passé. So last year. And this attempt to pull out of time's flow often goes with the desire to pull out of space or out of the physical world, as if God never really meant to give us a physical world, as if artists should always try to create out of nothing. But that's not new creation, of course. When Revelation celebrates the new heaven and earth, it doesn't mean the wholesale obliteration of the old one. When Paul speaks of the spiritual body of the future, he's not talking about the eradication of this one. There is judgment there is purging, but not annihilation. New creation speaks of this world, and I put it like this way, in this way, not dematerialized, but rematerialized. Not stripped of time, but energized with a new kind of time. Ourselves, not dehumanized, but rehumanized. 
this physical body, this quirky, clumsy, frayed, balding, decaying, and pain-ridden body brought out in a new edition. With that in mind, make sure you hear and see Steve Prince while you're here, a New Orleans-based artist who faced with the devastation of Hurricane Katrina depicts funerary traditions such as the dirge and the joyful renewal of the second line. Of this piece, he writes, for me, it echoes what Christ said to Nicodemus, that in order for us to enter into the kingdom of heaven, we must be reborn. The image is about rebirth of a community collectively joining together in celebration of the power of the Holy Spirit to renew those things that were considered dead. Along the same lines, just think for the moment about the materials that artists use and our physical engagement with them. Set them against this vista of the renewal of the old. And as a way in, let me recommend the extraordinary work of Tim Ingold, Professor of Social Anthropology at Aberdeen. In this study of creativity, he questions this desire to step out of time or out of our physical bodies and start from scratch with our supposedly disembodied minds. He takes his anthropology class to a beach north of Aberdeen, one that I know well, freezing, freezing cold. And he has a four-hour class on the beach where they learn to make willows, willow baskets from a local weaver. They learn it's not about dreaming up a plan out of nothing and imposing it on the material. The form of the basket emerges from the interaction of weaver and willow. It's not as if the hand simply empties out what's first in the head, head and hand together. Ingold has a fascinating chapter on drawing, sketching, which by its very nature never seeks a totalizing plan. The page doesn't have to be covered even. He cites Paul Clay's aphorism about the painter as the one who takes a line for a walk, where the movement of the hand and the size of the grain of the paper is integral to the result. This should, of course, resonate with voices you already know, streams of writers on embodied cognition. The scientist Michael Polanyi, David Sudno's account of playing jazz piano, and perhaps contestants on the great British Bake Off. Have you noticed how the result never quite matches the plan and is often far more interesting? Above all, Ingold stresses that the materials we work with themselves have a history and a future. They are, as he put it, on the way. The trouble is, to pick up Steve Prince's phrase, for many of us with our materials, we think of them as things dead. We consider them dead. Not so, says Ingold. Matter has more than a shape now, it's embedded in time, whether words, stones, or tones. Now set all this against the backdrop of creation, new creation, and things begin to happen. The very things we work with have been there before us, long before us, through the good favor of God. And now they are promised a renewal in the future beyond our imagination. They are on the way. Things always have more to give than can ever appear in one moment of encounter. And one day, one day even the willows will be shown to have more and be more. It's the artist's privilege to begin to show that now. Just some light thoughts to chew on over a cup of coffee on West Campus tomorrow to my last section. I said at the start, the most important thing that will happen here are conversations, new friendships, new networks of trust. So I want to suggest just two conversations that I think are needed today, and there are many, many more, but just to highlight two. And I'm thinking here of conversations between those who feel most at home in the world of theology and those who may feel most at home in the world of the arts. And if you feel completely at home in both, that makes you exceptional and exceptionally wise. Probably means you should be running for president. Okay, first then, <laughs> careful, a conversation. <laughs> conversation, first of all, about the words we love to use. 
as you all know when you work in this field a bit, certain key, key terms keep cropping up. Right? Beauty, transcendence, creativity, mystery, presence, and so on. But of course, living in the stream of new creation means these words, as with all our language, will get unraveled and rewoven, indeed, cleaned, made new. Take the beloved word beauty. Why do we so often think we already know what authentic beauty looks like or sounds like? Why bow to, for instance, the analytic philosopher to clean the word up for us and hand it to us ready for use? Of course, the concept of beauty has a venerable philosophical history. But is there not a danger of allowing a pre-existing philosophy of the transcendentals, perhaps, to set the stage? If we are going to go on repeating Prince Mishkin's remark and Dostoevsky is the idiot, beauty will save the world, it's worth asking what kind of beauty that is. If we are going to talk about God's beauty or created beauty and use words like radiance, unity, perfection, attraction, and so forth, will these not need to be constantly reshaped around what's been put on display there before us? the path God's beauty has actually taken, that is, through a merciless execution to a body stupendously alive. In short, I'd suggest the theology of beauty needs to descend to the dead with Christ and be reborn. And that means sitting at the feet of the likes of Flannery O'Connor or indeed Dostoevsky. It means feeling again the force of W.B. Yeats's words, love has pitched his mansion in the place of excrement. For nothing can be so or ho beautiful that has not been rent. In this symposium, please get to know, among others, Lanicia Rouse Tinsley, former student here, Houston based artist, who speaks much of beauty, but it's a very different kind of beauty from the sort that so easily slides into sentimentality. Or take that word, transcendence. It's another word that won't go away. There's a kind of gut react intuition, isn't there, that there's a special link between the transcendent beyond and the arts. And we need to take that gut intuition very seriously. But again, it would be odd to carry on as if we already know what that term is all about, and all we have to do is just, as it were, supply a little Christian varnish. A theologian of the new creation will remind us that God's transcendence has nothing to do with God being inaccessible or aloof. It's about God's, at the very least, difference from the world and uncontainability by the world. God's transcendence is the transcendence of love in action, a costly love that won't be contained, trapped, or defeated by this world. In other words, transcendence is good news. It's charged with good news. What does that look like in songwriting, movie making, <laughs> cake making? Anyhow, here's theologians and artists need each other to relearn the words we love to use. Second area of conversation, reductionism. Here, theologians and artists can work together to resist what I think is a virulent current in our culture. What's reductionism? Reduction is the attempt to flatten and compress everything onto one level. To reduce, for instance, all explanation to one level. What Donald Mackay, the scientist, used to call nothing buttery. Your sense of personal identity, hopes and fears and loves and beliefs are nothing but the behavior of a vast assembly of chemical and physical interactions. Nothing buttery or the attempt to reduce all value to one type. You want brass instruments for the music program in your high school? Well, show me how that will boost our revenue. As if economic gain were the sole criteria of value. Or again, the attempt to reduce all truthful language to one kind. If our speaking is going to carry truth, it has to be entirely reducible to descriptive propositions of the sort associated with the natural scientists. Just as well, no one told Jesus that. Needless to say, this kind of one-size-fits-all can be turned on the arts. 
The essayist and critic Louis Menon comments on Steven Pinker, the evolutionary biologist, who at his worst is a kind of evolutionary reductionist. Here's Louis Menon, quote, one suspects that enjoying Wagner, singing Wagner, anything to do with Wagner, this is the composer, is in gross excess of the requirements of natural selection. To say, to say that music is the product of a gene for art making, naturally selected to impress potential mates, which is one of the things Picker believes, is to say absolutely nothing about what makes any particular music significant to human beings. No doubt Wagner wished to impress potential mates. Who doesn't? But it's a long way from there to Parsifal. <laughs> it's here that theologians and artists need to work together to turn the tables on the reductionists, because it's the arts themselves, I suggest, that are the, probably the, most, the strongest antidote to reductionism that we have. What, after all, is the basic difference between the sketch and the side of a shoebox and Van Gogh's famous painting of boots? Former is useful for one purpose, getting the right shoe. The latter, though, is multiply suggestive, elusive. It's not vague or confused, but it has an array of possible connotations, layers of significance that can never be reduced to one statement, never captured by one explanation. It goes on and on giving. And this is almost bound to press us towards the theological, as Rowan Williams explores in his little classic, Grace and Necessity. As he puts it, art making is rooted in a sense of things being more than they are. Echoing Maritime. Art gives us physical objects that can embody the world's excess of meaning with particular potency. And that, and that will surely make us wonder if there's an energy at work in the world that can never be exhausted by this world, whose very life is a life of excess, of giving to and for the other. Believing in new creation means just that. Or you may want to look at Christina Bieber Lake's latest book, released next month. It's on American literary fiction and materialism. Her enemy is sociobiological determinism. She argues that storytelling, by its very nature, confers a dignity on the particular lives of ordinary people that is irreducible. And this is best described as an act of love that mirrors the love of the divine. No, of course it doesn't prove anything. It jerks the imagination out of its lazy reductionist habits. Folks, there are potential PhDs here PhDs galore just waiting to be written by some bright-eyed and bushy-tailed emerging scholar. Final word. Near the start, I quoted Wilbur, who commented that we never really invent anything but merely, quote, bear witness to what each morning brings again to light. Now, I think that's a little too simple, but it's the word witness I want to underline and finish with. Amid a lot of talk of originality, inventiveness, transgressing boundaries, perhaps this very biblical word and concept of witness is worth revisiting. By their very nature, witnesses are caught up in something they didn't start. Artists of the new creation will always at the deepest level be witnesses whatever the subject matter or style. Witnesses to something that didn't originate with them, something they didn't invent. Witnesses to someone, and someone, indeed, who has transgressed any boundary we are likely to face. Someone who has been there before us and who now goes before us. With that in mind, Awet, to sing again. This is an arrangement of a spirit which wonderfully ties together witness and new creation. I don't think we need to introduce it in any other way, need we? Just head in.